Years ago, around the time humans were first breaking the sound barrier, it served with distinction in the Coast Guard and agricultural industries of a civilization 600 light years away. Uniquely stable at very high and very low speeds, it offered a capable observation platform that could respond quickly and loiter in the tightest spaces. It dusted the windswept farming terraces carved into the northern mountains, and it spotted hurricane victims trapped in the tightest alleyways of flooded cities. It could climb to 50,000 feet in a few minutes. It could cruise comfortably at 330 knots, or as few as 45. Anywhere, anytime, and in short order. Its pilots called it a word that meant the time between lightning and thunder, and it wasn't long before they were racing it. An odd century later, the light barrier fell to those creatures like the sound barrier had before it. The golden record copy of Johnny B. Good plays in their airfield cafes, and still the old crowd favorite thrums overhead. Stripped of avionics and wing stress safety features and equipped with the cutting edge of graphene blades, it still clings to some of the fastest times in the ornithopter class. Long since legendary, children and starship captains alike dream of flying one. And today, Jimmy is the first human with the distinction. Or Mac Penderson, if you fancy the nameplate. No matter. Alright, I would apologize for that, but I spent way too much time greebling this thing to spare you a little world building to go with it. In any case, I've made enough headway on ornithopters for it to be worth talking about, and the headline is, Wow, Flyout has some strange joint physics. Enter the Prakasa Varken, or the O3V, as dubbed by Prakasa's human localization department. Humans like numbers. A, quote, spreadsheet species, they're sometimes called. Anyway, let's start by discussing the last flyout update, point two one nine three. As you might have noticed if you build ornithopters or fly mine or anyone else's, point two one nine three broke just about everything. I totally failed the notice because I was preoccupied with treeb flugels, but how the patch note, quote, stalls occur at a lower angle of attack, end quote, didn't set off a red flag, I couldn't tell you. Anyway, the reason why is pretty straightforward. Material science aside, it's one of the reasons we don't build things quite like this in real life. Blade stall. A stall occurs when a wing's angle of attack exceeds a critical angle. And because an ornithopter's wings are moving up and down quickly, but only angling up and down through a relatively shallow range, they tend to spend a lot of time at extremely high angles of attack. So what can we do about it? Well, there's a bunch of subtle, cool engineering options, and there's the grug-like funny worm movie option. I finally got around to seeing and did in fact like the funny worm movie, so let's start with that one. Lift coefficient? Efficiency? Where do you get silly ideas like those? Simply apply spice, in the form of save file editing, to the problem and double, triple, or even quadruple your hinge speeds. Doesn't that mean your wings will be at an even higher AOA standing still? It sure does! But even a stalled wing produces thrust if you beat it hard enough. You may have noticed this using fixed-pitch propellers trimmed for high speed. They start stalled, but you do move just enough to get some speed and then get unstalled. That's how the earliest version of this ornithopter worked. Its top speed was 440 knots. Its rotation speed was, drum roll please, a whopping 120 knots. It was around that speed that the wings would start to unstall. Alright, spice trip over. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have a lift coefficient at least approaching one? even at our now super high wing beat frequency? Wouldn't that generate an absolutely monumental amount of thrust? Yes, it would. Enter flaps and, more importantly, camber. Camber describes the shape and curvature of the wing, specifically its asymmetry top to bottom. Camber goes a long way to defining what the maximum angle of attack of a given wing will be. So what if we could give our wing a ton of camber whenever we wanted? Well, turns out there's a tool for that, the flap. So, what if our wing was almost all flap? That would give us a ton of camber control, and also allow us to direct some of our thrust downward for low speed flight. I had kind of discounted this idea in the past, but one day Messier hit me up with some ornithopter questions and showed me one he was working on. He had trouble getting it airborne from the ground at first, but unlike me, his static thrust was really good. Why? At first I wasn't sure, but... Looking closer, he had huge flaps and a ton of camber. His wings, while not quite unstalled stationary, were very close to being unstalled. So I took that idea to its logical extreme, and we get to the last video I posted, an unthrottleable near VTOL that worked by running its hinges either at full or two-thirds speed. It was even kind of sort of controllable, 
enough that grabbing a video only took two tries. So what can be done past that? Any number of things, really, but camber is the big one for this design. Other options include having a higher lift wing at a much lower frequency, which is the bird strategy, using a fast wing that flexes in a way that twists increasingly towards the tip, the dragonfly strategy, and somehow controlling the incidence of the wing independently from the wing beat stroke, plus any number of things that I haven't thought of yet or just don't know enough to think of. I'll be working on those. We've got our headliner for today, though, so for now we'll move on to other problems. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have real throttle, or perhaps more accurately, thrust lever control? Couldn't we do it by modulating the amplitude of the wing beat? All that defines that is the angle the outer hinge is connected to the inner hinge. Surely you could slip an extra hinge in there and... Let me stop you right there. A third hinge in the stack? Preposterous. Weren't you paying attention in Gary's Mod or Stormworks? You're lucky to stack two hinges stably. Even if you got it stable, it would have to be so heavy it could never fly. It'll be a cold day in hell the day you dynamically control wing amplitude with a third hinge. Right? It turns out it's actually possible to groupthink all by yourself. Who knew? Anyway, that's one of the reasons why I've been trying to get other people to build these things too. Once again, fortunately Messier was building one, and is much less Gary's Mod scarred than I am. He put a third hinge in and got it to work. I tried to replicate his design and wound up with something similar. Together, we learned flyout joints have a very unusual relationship with weight compared to other games, and suddenly both of our mechanisms had an extra joint and we're hardly any heavier or any sloppier than they used to be. In case you aren't similarly scarred, the background on this is that the strength of joints in physics games is nearly always relative to the ratio of weight between the base and the attachment, and that this applies to all axes including those that aren't supposed to move. If you want a solid joint, you need a heavy base and a light attached object. This makes for very quickly diminishing returns when attempting to chain hinges. In Stormworks, it becomes difficult to chain more than two hinges if said hinges will be moving quickly or under a lot of load. In Gary's mod, you'd have to go well out of your way to get even that far. Flyout both is and isn't like that. I'm still not totally certain on the particulars, but so far it seems the situation is this. The strength of joints in flyout does still scale with weight ratio, but only on the working axis rather than on all axes. That changes a lot, and means we can ignore weight ratio as long as the working axis of the joint in question won't be under much load. In turn, that means the inner hinges don't necessarily have to be heavier than the outer hinges. We only care how much force a working axis has to exert, no matter where in the chain it is. Our inner and outer hinges just counter-rotate at a slightly offset angle, as defined by the amplitude control hinge, which is in turn based on the throttle value. More throttle means steeper angle means more load, but still nowhere near as much load as if the mass were borne directly across a working axis. This is why the inner hinge can actually be lighter than the amplitude control hinge, as it feels the force of the wing obliquely rather than directly. It's under less load, so it doesn't need a steeper ratio. For all intents and purposes, the inner hinge only holds up the wing. So, even though we've added a whole extra hinge, we still only have one hinge that needs to be really heavy. The resulting assembly is heavier than the fixed amplitude design, but only by 20 or 30 percent, rather than 400 or 500 percent, as would be typical in other games. And just like that, we've got an ornithopter that can respond to throttle inputs and actually use autopilot speed hold. A huge improvement. But there's a problem. Thanks to our camber trick, we're now flying nearly VTOL, and wow, it's tough to fly like that. We don't have the benefit of mathematically driven cyclic-like control mixing schemes like the ones I used in Stormworks, so we're going to have to get creative. Messi and I tried a couple of things between us. We both experimented with differential amplitude, and I did end up using it as a secondary control method, but I found most of the best results working with leading edge devices. My ornithopters typically mix roll and sometimes pitch directly into the trailing edges of the main wings. But with all that flap input, a roll input in hover makes for way more adverse yaw than it does roll. On a flapping ornithopter, we could still mix pitch, but this, since this is a rocking ornithopter, mixing pitch into the big rocking control surfaces makes for a lot of shake at high speed. It can also interfere with the camber created by the flap and cause asymmetric blade stall. 
On a real aircraft, leading edge devices are typically purely flaps. They're used to modify the camber to accept higher angles of attack. They are here too, but I've set them up to do double duty. Since the leading edge doesn't move with the trailing edge, it offers a low incidence control option even while the trailing edge remains at a very high incidence. And that's a way past the adverse yaw problem. Now, just in case you happen to be very wealthy and some sort of aspiring aerospace engineer, I would caution you that I'm not sure this would work quite the same way in real life. I'm using leading edge devices here almost like canards, like reverse control surfaces on the front of the wing, which they are, but it's usually not that simple. A wing is really one unit. The whole thing has to be considered together, and I think at low speeds, moving a leading edge device like this would actually have the effect of spoiling lift on one wing or the other, rather than acting as a conventional aileron. Basically, I think this control scheme would probably sort of work, but in the reverse sense that Flyout seems to think it would. Take that with a grain of salt, though. I'm just a pilot. I do all my engineering with computers. In any case, since we don't need these leading edge devices to provide pitch control at speed, we have a conventional elevator for that, we can mitigate the pitch shake problem by only using the leading edges to control pitch while we're hovering, and phasing out pitch control with pressure damp while leaving roll control alone. So now we've got both pitch and roll mixed into our leading edges, and an ornithopter that's not just controllable but agile in the air down to just a handful of knots. And I think that just about does it for mechanical design. A throttleable V-Stoll ornithopter edging ever closer to the funny worm ideal. But we're not done yet. Ornithopters are strange critters, and organizing all this bizarre control mixing in a usable way and providing a prospective pilot with all the information they'll need to make good use of it is a task in of itself. Usually I don't spend a ton of time on ergonomics, but this aircraft, this one was different. As you might guess, this aircraft has some very unique behavior that I'll get into as we go. For now, let's start with the gold standard, Dune. A bit ago, Microsoft released a Dune Ornithopter for FS2020 as part of a tie-in, and it's awesome. This video isn't about that, so I won't go into detail, though I'd suggest you fly it yourself, but one of my favorite things about it is it auto-transforms. Rather than sliding in and out of VTOL based on a secondary control input like other VTOLs, it simply favors forward flight or vertical flight dynamically based on how quickly you're already going. It's seamless, astonishingly natural, and goes a long way to reducing pilot workload during transition in a very real, not just flavor texty kind of way. Besides, something about it just seems appropriate for ornithopters, so I decided I wanted to implement something similar. Microsoft has the advantage of cheating, necessarily. FS2020 doesn't support variable geometry such that you could build a true ornithopter. Here's hoping 2024 will, but that's beside the point. Anyway, I figured I would be in for an uphill battle. To my surprise, moving to auto-transform made the aircraft immediately easier to fly and produced better performance at a wider range of airspeeds. So that was done and dusted with just a handful of reversions to the editor. Of course, flyout doesn't let you do math and in input fields, so in doing so, I did give up the ability to command the trailing edges for maneuvering, but I had already shifted that responsibility to the leading edges, so it wasn't a problem. This wasn't perfect off the bat. There were a few hours of messing with fly-by-wire inputs and weight and balance, but none of that involved any weird problem solving, so I won't bore you with it. Suffice to say that if you want to build something like this, you'll probably have to mix in angular velocity and angular acceleration. Note that those would be the P and D terms of a PID controller commanding angular velocity into your low airspeed pitch control. This isn't a video about PID controllers though, so instead let's get into some ergonomic idiosyncrasies. For one, what is going on with that airspeed indicator? Gee, Bill, your mom lets you have two yellow arcs? Yep, time to talk about wings some more. Remember the spice trip? How we're just beating our mostly stalled wings so hard it doesn't matter? Well, that does have some consequences. For one, these wings spend a lot of time operating very near the edge of their stress limits. Load them too quickly and they'll explode. That's what the first yellow arc is for. Keep the amplitude under about 80 while your airspeed is under 80, and you should be safe. Second, there's the whole stall thing. We've mitigated a lot of that with our insane takeoff camber, but that camber doesn't last forever. As we transition out of vertical flight, the trailing edge flap angle, and thus camber, gradually relaxes. Most of this transition is smooth, but not all of it. 
It so happens that the rate at which the wing must be relaxed in order to consistently overcome drag results in a narrow Venn diagram where the wing has neither enough camber nor enough airspeed to keep from stalling. This occurs roughly between 200 and 240 knots if flying with the maximum amplitude selected. That is the second yellow arc. The aircraft accelerates very violently in this part of the envelope as the wings are fully unstalling and finally attaining their true power. At the same time, it will lose almost all pitch control if you allow the wings to stall while this is happening. It's a brief window, and it isn't a huge problem if you're on top of it. But a better approach is to chop your amplitude down to about 60% or so while the aircraft makes its way through this part of the airspeed band. In doing so, you'll find everything smooths right out, and you'll still have plenty of power to spare. This happens for a number of reasons, but I believe chief among them is, in reducing the amplitude, you reduce the speed at which the blades move up and down, and therefore their angle of attack. Thrust line seems to be involved as well, though, as the problem can be averted in all cases by using a little bit of flyby wire to prevent the ornithopter from accelerating too quickly. So why not just implement that flyby wire here? Originally I did, but after all the testing I'd done, I found I actually missed the exotic stick and rudder experience of needing to deal with it myself as the pilot. I like that this thing doesn't just look like an ornithopter and isn't just technically an ornithopter under the hood. You are flying an ornithopter and you can tell. Plus, it makes for fun warning light and greebling fodder, and this is supposed to be a stripped-down, modified racing ornithopter after all. Speaking of warning lights, what are those about? Again, amplitude. Both red lights warn the pilot of excessive amplitude, but each covers a different reason. The inner light is very straightforward. You can't use all of the amplitude range while you're on the ground, or you'll strike the ground with your wings. That light is there to let you know when you need to back off and factors both your altitude over the ground and your current amplitude into this indication. The outer light circles back to the problem I described with the first airspeed arc. It is possible to overburden the wings and break them if your airspeed is low. This light factors your airspeed and your amplitude setting together to warn you if you're putting too much load on the wings. Both of these lights have an accompanying buzzer and your response to both should be the same. Reduce your amplitude just a little until the light and sound go out. Depending on the weather and altitude, it may be necessary to brush up against these warnings, but as long as you stay near the bottom of them, you should be safe. With both lights out, you ought to be totally safe. So that's the Prakasa Varken, and everything I know so far about the current state of ornithopters in flyout and how best to achieve them. We inch ever closer to the House Atreides ideal, preferably sans interstellar feudal war. How close? I'm not sure. Some early versions of the Varken were actually capable of a static parking brake engaged vertical takeoff, but I never really got it to work well and eventually saved over that version and failed to ever reproduce the behavior. Messier described a similar experience. In any case, one big advantage we have here in flyout over Stormworks is that control surfaces can be articulated freely through 360 degrees. This means that we could, say, mount our wingbeat mechanism at a fixed 45 degree positive incidence and then use the massive trailing edge flaps with positive or negative values to select between forward and vertical flight. I'm pretty sure this will work, but I haven't gotten it to work so far. Past that, since joint strength works the way it does, I'm pretty certain I could come up with a design that rotates the entire flapping mechanism. I kind of want to avoid that, though. To me, one of the interesting things about ornithopters in nature is that they don't need to do that to hover. The motion of a dragonfly is closer to the former approach. I don't know, that just tickles my interest a little more directly. One big change we could see come down the line is scripting. I've mentioned here and there times I've had my hands tied by a lack of scripting support. On one hand, I'm kind of glad we at least started out this way. It's resulted in doing a few things the hard way and learning some interesting tech in doing so, such as the joint stack configuration in use here, that will still be paying dividends even with access to scripting. It's also made for some very interesting creative problem solving. That said, I cannot emphasize enough how much more control we could have over wingbeat minutia if we could script complex behavior. I'm talking dynamic roll yaw mixing, biasing the up and down oscillation of the wing toward the positive or negative in real time, biasing the amplitude toward anhedral or dihedral, you name it. It really would change everything, and something like an Atreides ornithopter replica both in form and function would become an immediately realizable goal. Who knows when that'll be though? And I'm not totally sure we can't come up with such an ornithopter before then anyway, especially if we put our heads together. Now if we could just get a nice thrumming drone to fill the deadly silence this mechanism leaves you in, then we'll really be set. 
Anyway, cheers, and I hope to see you hovering out there watching for Worm Sign. Actually, wait, quick postscript here. Does anybody who's more familiar with Dune than I am know if the Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie sign is a worm sign? Is that a Dune reference? Because that is news to me. <laughs>